Mango. Okay. Um, Ready? Okay, welcome everybody. Dan Bates, President and CEO, Greater Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. And we are thrilled that you joined us today uh, with yet another episode of the conversation. So this is a great place where business owners and professionals come together to discuss p uh, key ideas and um, business themes. And um, you know, today we're really excited because the conversation is going to be around data bias, which in of itself sounds pretty boring. This is not a boring topic. Um, and the uh, book that will be kind of a reference uh, for this, Invisible Women, is far from boring. So um, don't let the topic data bias scare you off. This is really going to be a very exciting conversation, especially because uh, we have our facilitator, Byron Skaggs, with Infinite Ping, of which he is the owner. Um, and a well-known uh, certified business coach and a, a very active chamber member with this chamber. We're glad to have Byron on board with us. And uh, to add to that excitement, uh, we have Lisa Sandlin, um, who I was going to say is from Lisa Sandlin Design, but Lisa has pulled everything under one umbrella with the help of one of our other chamber members, and she is now Lisa Sandlin from Empowerworks. So, um, we're very excited to uh, have Lisa joining us today. And from her des design perspective, um, and being a, a woman-owned uh, business uh, professional, um, I think really has some great insight to add to the topic today. So with that, it's time for me to shut up and turn it back over um, to Byron to get us started. Great, thank you, thank you, Dan. Um, and I am, uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of uh, the chamber and to be a part of conversations like this. Um, I, I need to I need to pause at the beginning of this and say that um, for all the different issues that are taking place in our country uh, that have been occurring in the last number of weeks, um, this conversation about data bias was something that I put on the schedule back in January. Um, and it was an intentional focus to try to diversify the books and the conversations and the authors of whom we were listening to and reading that spark these conversations. Uh, to locate myself, I mean, I'm almost six foot eight, um, white, uh, nearly 300 pounds, and um, I've spent almost 20 years of my life living in a uh, minority status ethnically and religiously in the Middle East. Um, so having grown up culturally in, in places that are culturally different than uh, what we might think of a normal North American uh, culture, um, has has informed a lot of things about my life and my decisions that I make. I'm also very, very aware that there's a lot of things I don't know. Um, and and that's equally disturbing um, that I'm, I'm still in this process of learning. I wish I could say that I've learned it all, um, but I wanna continue to learn. I wanna be an active learner ongoing. Uh, so, it was, it was important to me to uh, bring this to these chamber conversations, uh, to have some sort of uh, voice that wasn't a typical white North American male business author. Um, and so I'm, I'm bringing this forward, but I love the fact that as I'm looking at the screen, I have a number of other women owned business owners um, who can help teach me today. Uh, and that's really what this is about. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and for the chance to have many of you uh, in the conversation. Uh, so th there are a couple of things I just wanted to just as an introduction. Uh, and then and then I want to kind of just we'll step into the conversation, but as an introduction piece. Um, the, the, the issue of data bias and as Dan said, this is really quite interesting because it's, it's not necessarily about the issue, it's about the pattern. 
It's not even why we're here. It's about the pattern. And that's what matters. And how do we change the patterns? That's one of the questions. Um, what can we do to change patterns? Um, the gap that we see, whether it's gender or race or another uh, issue in that sense, this is not a coincidence. This is a matter of patterns that have been established historically over time. And it's a question of how do we change these things and what can we do to be a part of that change? Um, and it really is a cause and consequence that is of unthinking that conceives humanity as almost exclusively male and white. Um, so part of what I wanna be able to talk about today is this concept of mindfulness. What does it mean to locate ourselves so that we can then be able to understand that we are and we do bring a culture to the table. It, what we have is, is really important, but it's also important to understand that others don't think and act or believe in the same way that we do. And so it's important to listen and have that empathy as much as anything else. Uh, but it's the unthinking aspect that I think is, is, has been the cause and consequence of much of what we've experienced uh, and what's been sparking uh, so much here recently. And the other concept is that data is not objective, um, even though it's often assumed to be so, especially when we get into IT and technology. There's the assumption that data is objective, uh, and it's not. Um, and that's part of what this conversation will be about as well. Uh, I also want to mention, you, you may see on the screen um, the name Jennifer, and that is my wife. And so I'm thrilled to have her uh, with us on the conversation as well. Uh, Dr. Jennifer has been a professor um, in, uh, in higher education uh, at the university level, uh, also studying women and gender, uh, especially in STEM and engineering, but uh, across the spectrums as well. So, um, and she is a policy research person. And, uh, and I just really enjoyed hearing Lisa and Jen uh, talk the other night at the, at the Mix It Up. That was a lot of fun. So uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, so as we're participating today, um, I'm going to ask that, yeah, uh, I noticed I think almost everybody has their stuff on mute except for Lisa and I, which is great. Um, and it just kind of helps eliminate some of the other noise uh, background wise. Um, but would love for you to tell us in the chat, whether you're on Facebook or you're on Zoom, uh, just, just locate yourself. Where are you at city ways? Physically locate yourself. Where are you at city and state? Uh, if you're in another country, please let us know that. Uh, tell us your name. I uh, would love to know where you're, where you're coming in from for the conversation. And uh, we do welcome questions and interaction during this time. And uh, those can be just directed, either comments or, or questions through chat on Zoom or Facebook Live. Uh, thanks to uh, our friends at the chamber. Uh, Laura and Tiffany are helping to monitor that. So they'll chime in with those questions as we go. Um, so that's just a real quick introduction. Literally, that's about all you're gonna see on the slides. If you want to minimize this, I'm just gonna keep this open for a little bit uh, for that this particular slide uh, in case somebody else comes along and wants to, uh, you know, just wants to, 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 to chime in, this will be there for them. Lisa, I would love for you to share a little bit about your background. Um, what has, I, just even from, from our conversations, I'm just, I'm fascinated by the, 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 the trajectory that your life has, has come on, but at a point, I believe in your late 20s, early 30s, when this concept of design came for, for a very specific reason. Uh, and I would love for you to explain and share that with us. And what is it that uh, is really driving your passion right now? Thank you, Byron. So um, I started out early on in my life as an entrepreneur. I've always had that desire. Um, I went into the financial services business early on, but when I was 28, I had the privilege of being able to take care of my aging grandmother. And my father was a home builder. And I realized that even though my dad could make all types of modifications and whatever we needed to do to my grandmother's house, it feasibly, financially, and even plan-wise didn't make any sense because we were gonna have to take a three bedroom and turn it into a two bedroom to enlarge her bathroom she, no matter what we did, there were gonna be three steps going into her house. She had her, her laundry in the lower level. The house just did not work for her as an 88 year old woman. 
So as her health declined, um, my family took turns going in and taking care of her. And then we realized that we just had to move her out of her home of 30 years, which was traumatic and devastating to her and to the family. We moved her in with my aunt and uncle thinking that their ranch home would be better. Um, she then um, went into a wheelchair and she became a wheelchair user. Their bathroom was large enough, but there wasn't anything safe about it. She could not transfer to the toilet. It still had a bathtub. And even with all of the medical devices, the durable medical equipment that we can add to a facility like that, it becomes ugly, it becomes cumbersome for the other users in the household. And we still had to, someone had to literally pick the wheelchair up and take her in and out of her home. We then moved her to a facility that was supposedly a retirement facility, but I quickly realized that even their bath facility did not work. Um, she had a sunken bathtub. And so how do you get an 88, she was 90 at that point, woman in and out of the bathtub? So I realized that they were only bathing her once a week in the facility. I started taking her out to my parents' house, again, not designed for wheelchair use. There was no accessibility. I had to, we had to lift her up two steps to get her into the home, down a very tight hallway, manipulate her into the door that um, I hit the doorway, you know, the, the trim and everything, then wheeled her into the bathroom, had to climb over the vanity like a monkey, get in front of her and assist her onto the shower chair or the bathtub chair because my parents didn't have a shower either. So after a couple years of that, shortly after my grandmother passed, I decided that I had to change the way houses were designed. And I told my dad, you know, you're a builder, but my father's, you know, everybody thinks you have a ranch, it's going to work. Um, ranches don't work. They still have steps going in and out. So at the age of 32, married, raising four children, I enrolled at the University of Cincinnati Design Art, Architecture and Planning Program with a mission to design a better house or to learn how to do it. I quickly realized that we do not teach that on the university level, that residential design is considered taboo. So I took every course that I could take on universal design, on um, aging, uh, it wasn't aging in place then, but it was long-term care design, like retirement facilities, healthcare design, pretty much created my own curriculum with what I wanted to do. And then, um, Upon, well, my, the last year of my master's work, I started teaching at, the Miami, at Miami University in Oxford, um, realizing that most people didn't really care <laughs> what I was doing. So that kind of led then into teaching for the National Home Builders Association. And I taught a universal design class and I taught aging in place. I wrote a book in 09 entitled Houses That Work For Life. And that has been my mission is to empower people to live long, healthy, happy lives in every aspect that I possibly can. So through my design practice, I did a lot of study and work on universal design, which means designing inclusively for people of all sizes, gender, abilities, disabilities, cultures, um, ages, both cognitively and physically without stigmatizing or setting people apart. So it's quite the challenge. When I taught at the university, I taught from 06 to 09 at the University of Cincinnati and I taught universal design. And I would look at the students' faces. I'm talking to masters of architecture students and they would just kind of look at me like I was totally out of my mind because the principles of universal design are pretty much impossible to meet, especially in the traditional way of thinking. And that's what I kept trying to urge the students is you have to think out of the box. My dad would tell me, you know, houses have a 36 inch hallway. That's the typical standard design. And, I, and he said, he told me, he said, people will not pay for a wider hallway. And I said, then we have to design houses without hallways because you, ha you can't stay with the typicals, you have to think out of the box. 
So that's kind of my background and, and how I've evolved into the world that I'm in today. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. And um, I think one of the things that sparks an interesting, I mean, component for me is, is it's through that experience that you discovered a passion. Um, it was, it's still, it's still driven by the, the struggle and the, and the lack of dignity really of, of the care for your grandmother. Um, that was the, not the lack of dignity of the care, but the lack of dignity in, in the space that what it seemed to not provide. Does, right. does that make sense? Not, and it still exists today. I mean, our homes today are not being designed any differently unless you are looking at your end of life home. Our production builders are not looking at, they're looking at the two story, you know, three, four bedroom, what sells. They're not looking at what actually would empower people throughout their lives. Um, a majority of my clients, I've just had three new clients come in in the last two weeks, are special needs families. Families that have brought um, a child home from the hospital and realize very quickly that this child has cerebral palsy and you have a situation where you make do, you do whatever you can until that child becomes so large that mom can't carry him up and down the steps anymore. Mom is not empowered to do anything to properly care for that child. We also have that situation with all of the illnesses that occur and people that, um, I tell the story of my father. My dad supported me going to college. Um, he actually helped me with the tuition because I went later in life. I was very proud of the fact that I was going to school. Did not quite understand why I was doing what I was doing. He, um, we, we, I would laugh about it because he would refer to it as my paraplegic design philosophy. And he never quite understood that it was about the natural aging process. If we live long enough, and you know, our life expectancies now, our actuary tables on life insurance go out to 120. People don't realize that life expectancy is increasing dramatically. If we live long enough, we are going to need some type of a device for mobility, be it a cane, be it a walker, be it a wheelchair. And so my father ended up passing away in the home that he had built without any modifications with a standard 36 inch hallway with a standard five by seven bathroom with the bathtub. And he looked up at me two weeks before he passed away from his wheelchair with a tear coming down his eye. And he said, honey, you keep doing what you do because I now get it. He goes, I just want the dignity to wheel myself into that bathroom and shave myself, and I can't do it. And so that was when he realized the importance that whether it's the last few years of your life or whether it's the last two weeks of your life, we all deserve to have that type of dignity to take care of ourselves. And then I think I shared with you too, Byron, and I know that Tiffany's husband could speak to this, it's very difficult in a lot of homes when the funeral homes come to retrieve the body to get the body out of the home with dignity because they cannot get the gurneys down these hallways. You can't turn into the bedrooms where the people typically are when they pass away. And it's very difficult um, for the family to experience what happens in those last few moments when the person leaves their home. So I look at all of those things in the way that I design. But in, from your standpoint, being as tall as you are, um, that, that is where it just gets extremely difficult for people because we're so accustomed to having our houses look a certain way and be designed a typical way with typical level countertops and standard height this and standard height that. And it's, it's, you know, the book addresses all of that about design because all of the data on our standards and typicals that we use across the board are for the average size male. And 
women are not considered in the sizing of anything. So it's very easy for a five foot two woman um, to brush her teeth at a 32 inch high vanity, but it's very difficult for Byron to do that. Um, and I never could understand. I can tell you why. Do you guys want to know why vanities are so low in a typical bathroom? They, the size of the vanity was determined because when we brought water into the house, prior to that, we had a wash stand with a bowl and a pitcher on top of it. So when you put the bowl on top of it, then it brought it up to a, a better height for the average size person at that time, because people weren't as tall back then. And so then when they decided to bring plumbing in, they just recessed that bowl down into the van, into the wash stand. So there's a lot of standards that just don't really make sense. But when you know the history of it, you get it. it it's, it's, it's fascinating what happens sometimes um, it, to, to speak to that point of just what becomes tradition when it's not necessarily right. Um, when I speak to people about the idea of con the concept of core values, I talk about how there's multiple different types of values. One of those types of values is what's called accidental values. And the accidental values are those things when you have a homogenous group that literally takes over a particular um, arena and the values they bring forward are actually, you know, biased towards them and against others. Um, and that's an accidental value. And so when we, when we stumble upon those accidental values and begin to see them, what do we do? It's, you know, how do we begin to address those changes? Um, a lot of it comes down to this mindfulness, being aware. You know, you, you, you speak about your, your father in his 80s, almost 90, right? He was, um, he was 80 when he passed away. Okay, 80. Um, and, but, that, but that recognition near the end of his life where he says, I finally see what you're doing. Um, my goal <laughs> is, is, and I think this would probably be along the lines of your goal, is to help people begin to see these things earlier and sooner and not to dismiss them. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, the, the, the book kind of is broken up into a couple different sections. Um, <laughs> the first section is on personal um, and, and the way it affects personal life. And then there's a section on work life and then there's some on design. Um, and I, I thought I wanted to kind of focus a little bit on the work section, but then also into the design and some of the other pieces as, as we go along. But um, the, the idea of, of how the, the, the data bias um, is influenced in the workplace when it comes to hiring, when it comes to, um, oh my goodness, um, designing of tools for, for the jobs. Um, so many different aspects where the assumption is, the standard is, you know, an average sized male, white male. Um, can you, uh, Talk a little bit of, I mean, just in terms of your experience with the design aspect, but even just from, I mean, I'm assuming having a father that did a lot of contract work, you've been in and around construction jobs and contract, you know, what are some of the things that you've seen or experienced um, in that realm that kind of supports the ideas of, of the workplace data bias? Well, all the way to um, ergonomics and human factors. And what we learn to use as far as um, in the workplace, designing a workstation, uh, sight lines, um, height of people, you know, the, the thing that has happened is that all of the charts and data that I, you know, and I went to college 20 years ago, and I can speak because my brother is a current industrial design professor at UC, so I know what's kind of happening now. Um, <clears throat> but the standards were the standards. And so the human body was Le, Le Corbusier's human figure of what an arm reach would be and what all of the data around a male average body would be. 
um, the way that we combated a lot of that in design with, um, with even a desk chair is flexibility that things have to be able to expand and contract and rise and tilt and ergonomics of working at a workstation. So it became flexibility. And that's really what universal design is, um, is being able to easily adapt to whatever ability, size, shape, um, person that is working there. But typically in the workplace, um, in industry and everything, there have been standards that were all based around the man um, and in and, and their reach and their strength. People don't realize, um, the one thing I learned in the book, and I, I haven't had a chance because I ha or the YMCA hasn't been back for me to work with my other fitness instructors, but um, the, the, the author of the book claims that no matter how much a woman works out, our hand strength will never be as great as a man's hand strength even a man that doesn't work out. So, you know, like we're always asking our husbands or someone, a man to help us open a jar because sometimes we just can't get that jar open and they'll pop it open like it's nothing. So I started thinking about things like that and the tools that we use in the workplace and even, even a device, you know, people don't understand everything in the built environment, everything that you interact with, from putting your clothes on each day to the chair that you're sitting in, to the pen that you write with, has been designed. So what data is being used to design that? What human factors are they looking at? So in my brother's program at UC, which I've been involved with now since um, I went to college in 92, so I've stayed involved with all of that, they do have programs now where they design power tools. And you will see specifically power tools designed for men and power tools designed for women. So when it comes to household tools, um, you don't see them readily on the market, but they are available. But then I was thinking about kitchen utensils. Who are kitchen utensils designed for? You know, typically it's the woman in the house. Um, OXO, OXO is an incredible brand that is addressing universal design and grip strength and stuff for the aging, but I don't know if they're really looking at gender. Um, and, and you see, you know, typically if you want to take something that has been designed for a man, you offer it in the color pink, and now it's designed for a woman without any other changes, right? So I was... Um, or, or they do that with Legos, maybe. No, I'm just Yeah. <laughs> I was amazed in the book when she talked about our military and our police force. Mm -hmm. And the fact that our military that now welcomes women, and I, I don't know what the percentages of women are in the force, but none of the uniforms are designed specifically for women. The gear that they have to yeah. use is still designed for men. So when they're wearing a pair of army boots to go walk through the jungle, they are in just a smaller sized man's boot. And women's feet are not the same as a man's foot. Our arches are different, the shape is different. Women's shoes are designed differently. Um, if a woman has ever tried to wear a man's tennis shoe, you can tell it's different. Even though it might fit you, it doesn't fit you well. So I was just appalled at the fact that our military and our police offers no difference in a flak jacket. Really, men are a little different body builds than women when it comes to fitting a flak jacket or a, you know, a bulletproof vest. To get it to fit a woman's chest size, it's going to be huge in gap down at the waist size. So. She addressed that in the book saying they can't, they can't get their guns, they can't reach their other weapons to protect themselves. So most often, women police officers have to remove their flak jacket to be able to have the agility to protect themselves. And then they most often get hurt because of that. And, and that nobody's looking at that kind of stuff. So that, that was one of the things that really amazed me um, about 
the book. I found the book to be absolutely fascinating. It opened my eyes up to many things. Um, your wife, Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer, uh, opened my eyes to something. I made the comment to her the other night because the book addresses something that we address heavily in my financial world. And that is women's um, lifestyles are very different than men because we are the caregivers. We are the ones that work many, many paid less hours um, to take care of our children and to take care of our elderly parents and to take care of our spouses, quite frankly. In the financial world, uh, who needs long-term care protection? Um, all, all people need it. Uh, seven out of 10 people are gonna require long-term care. But typically, the man has his wife to continue to take care of him until he passes away. Who's gonna take care of her? And so, it's situations like that, that we are the caregivers. I stressed to Dr. Jennifer that I thought it was because it was more of our nature, that women are nurturers. And Jen, you can kick in here at any time. I can't see you on my screen, but she informed me that that is a cultural difference, not a gender difference. I guess it would be gender, but not a sexual difference as far as being man or woman. Do you want to that sure um so what what's happened though and and I, I loved when we talked part of our discussion was that it has been so ingrained in our culture and and just as it's so fascinating to go back and design and learn about you know the bowl and the pitcher and the height of things you go back into you know the beginnings of of uh our country uh, you go back into who was out hunting, you know, you can go back into Western civilization, especially, and it's, it's been the men who are in charge. So it just naturally starts to uh, build, and then it feels like it's essential, like we are all essentially the caregivers when it, it truly is cultural. And you can see that when you see, go back into uh, prehistoric Neanderthal uh pre-civilized um civilizations uh that are proto-feminist and you can also see it when you go into when anthropologists are finding civilizations that the women are the ones who are in leading and the caregiving is shared equally by men and women so we've just been uh conditioned to see it a different way and so there's a lot of values that are attached to that and what happens, and I know we talked about this too, is there's cultural and moral issues of who's the caregiver and who's um, lacking on their caregiving skills if it's socially expected that it will be the woman and the woman does not do that. Uh, there's, there's tension as, it, as it's different. So one of the things I did want to ask about um, was you know talking about the tools and the design uh, we talk a lot about the pink tax so when tools are made for women or you know whatever their color or their design or when things are specifically made for genders it seems they're much more expensive than anything that's made for men and so uh, we've called it the pink tax even when it comes to deodorants um, nice smelling pretty deodorants cost a lot more money than male deodorants and so I would love, in the, from a design standpoint, if you could ask, talk about that. I'm not really sure other than it would be considered because of the male bias being the norm, right? That's the standard. So when you design something specifically for a woman, it becomes a specialty item. And specialty items can always cost more. And women will pay more. Um, <laughs> To have to have that type of uh, we think it's it's care right it's 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 special for us to have things that smell pretty and and look pretty and mm -hmm. um, you know my my design my personal design experience has been more about um, aiding the elderly than it has been women but even looking at at fashion design and how. <clears throat> I think I shared with you guys, I, I do a, 
a course for my brother's class. Um, he teaches global design issues at UC and he has me come in once a year and talk about the biggest design challenge that we're facing today. And that's longevity. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're all living so much longer and that affects every aspect of design. So like I said earlier about everything that we interact with is being designed. Um, our cars are designed, our clothing's designed. So when you think about the attire and the things that happen to a woman's body versus, well, I guess men have the issues too, but it's much more difficult for women to um, go to the bathroom than it is for men. So when you think about, they talked in the book about even fashion, uh, not design, but the, the uniforms that scientists in yeah. the Antarctic, you know, the warmest thing to wear is a coverall. Well, that's great if you're a man and you have a zipper, but women don't have that access. So these scientists were talking about having to completely undress to be able to go to the bathroom. And, and all of the things that happen with women monthly that are not addressed um, worldwide about attire and just even supply. Um, but as we age, um, even to clasp and unclasp a bra, which you know men don't have to worry about anything like that, but how, how design evolves for for the aging population to make things easier to, you know, I, I talk in the class about, you know, we all love to wear the sexy little black dress that zips up the back. Well, when you get a certain age and you live by yourself, how in the heck are you supposed to use that zipper? <laughs> and it's, you can't, you just, you can't get to it. You can't reach it. So thinking about things like that, um, even as we age, those gender specific things pop up. And, and it's, to me, it's fascinating. But to answer your question, it's because it, it's in the, the, the realm of design, because everything is still so biased towards men, anything designed for a woman is a specialty item, which it shouldn't be for half of the population, right? <laughs> I, you know, I, that's, I was, I mean, when Jen mentions that, I was thinking, uh, you know, even even just a, a a razor for shaving. You know, I mean, the, the price differences. You know, in in that area, uh, um, it, it's it's interesting too when um, when you're talking about like the protection pieces for military and police. It led me to to think even into the medical fields, and um, or even PPE. You know, the personal protection equipment that we're all becoming very very familiar with. And yet the vast majority of those things have been designed for a unisex or universal male. Um, so masks don't fit properly. Facial structures are different. And it's not just a gender thing. It's also, uh, it's also an ethnicity and a race thing. There's, I mean, different facial features, different structures of bodies and bones and all these things. And they're not designed, they're designed for a traditional white male. And, um, you know, that's a huge struggle uh, and, a, and, a, and a problem when it comes to health and safety of, of the people who are trying to literally on the front lines, you know, providing care and health and, and, and those pieces. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating to me how when we, when we think of this in, in one particular area, we could go down a whole conversation uh, things and never touch on some of the other parts to this. This is truly a comprehensive issue of awareness. Um, you know, and I, and I'm just going to bring up a couple different examples from the book, um, just because I want to kind of, you know, show how broad and diverse this kind of a thing is. There was a, one of the, and it was one of the early conversations that I actually watched, um, the, the author speak. She's, she's, uh, from the UK. And so uh, I, I watched her speak um, at, a, at an event where um, she tells a story and then it's, it's in the book as well, but it's the idea of how a 
a city in Sweden where they were really pushing for the whole notion of equality and that they're one of the more progressive countries in the world, uh, pushing toward the idea of, well, we're going to, you know, just even the idea of snow plowing, you know, you can't, you can't bring gender into snow plowing. Well, actually they can when they realized that how they were snow plowing was impacting the, 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 the female population dramatically more than the male population. And, and the idea behind that was their first plan, when snow hits, they hit highways and major arteries first. Then they go back and hit residentials and sidewalks for plowing. But what they found was the men who leave and go to work, leave once, drive out, go to work, sit, drive back home. It's the women who are most often on their feet, walking, using public transportation, um, and often carrying children, pushing children in a stroller, walking with children or walking with the elderly, and they're making multiple stops. They're going out and they're going to take care of their elderly, elderly parents. They're going to the grocery store. They're doing this, they're doing that, and they're chaining their transportation to different places. And what they realized was by not plowing sidewalks first, by not taking care of the closer, smaller artery roads, the smaller uh, tertiary roads, they were actually having a greater impact on health and physical damage and the, the safety issues, hospitalizations were up dramatically. And when they turned it around and began plowing those first to care for those who were walking and not driving, realizing that somebody who's driving on three inches of snow yeah, if they slide off the, off the road, they're not going to get hurt. But if somebody slips and falls on three inches of snow, they're probably going to get hurt. And uh, they saw a dramatic drop in their hospitalizations and, and, and health and safety pieces when they began to think about even snow plowing differently. Um, it's fascinating how, how much this feeds into everything that we do. Um, the other one that I just wanted to bring up was the idea of, you mentioned earlier, paid or the unpaid number of hours and, and how women have a dramatically heavier workload. But the assumption is they're not because many of them are working part-time jobs, but the unpaid number of hours is what really factors in, in a way that is not something that is commonly accepted for, for men. And so um, the notion that uh, a woman works, you know, maybe less hours, but then maybe it has to work several different hours because they're also trying to juggle the other care issues that are going on that are considered unpaid. Um, she spoke specifically to an issue in England where their pension, their long-term benefits, retirement benefits, were linked to how well they worked in a paid environment throughout their career. So men, benefited greater in their retirement years than a woman who was bouncing between part-time jobs. And even if she had two or three part-time jobs, they said those cannot be cumulatively collected and, and connected in a way that it contributes to the pension in the same way. And so even in the way that policy is, de is designed and developed at a, at a national level has traumatic and dramatic uh, impact on this long-term, long-term care, long-term longevity, life, life expectancy. Um, and Lisa, I, I, I wanted just to add to that. You said, yeah, life expectancy is increasing. I think even from the book, they mentioned life expectancy of women is extending even further beyond men. And that's, and that's an issue that is not being addressed. No, um, no not at all. And speaking to um, the pension, which in our country is Social Security, right? It's not supposed to be a pension, but that's what people look at. It is based on what your earnings have been. Um, so however much you get is based on however much you've made. So yeah. tomorrow when I do the Women's Wealth and Wellness presentation, I think that's at 1.30, um, we're going to talk about the difference in the workforce. It's not that women work less. We actually work more. We work less paid hours. So we are the ones that take off when the kids are sick. We're the ones that take off to take our parents to 
the doctors when they need it. We are the ones that are constantly in and out of the workforce, having babies, um, doing the things that women do. So we have less retirement. Our 401ks on average are less. We still make 82 cents to the dollar of every male paying job, not necessarily because of the work paying it, paying us less, but because of the hours that we can work in that position because we are the caregivers and we are the ones that come out in and out of the workforce so often. So we're gonna address that tomorrow, but it's, it's I resonated completely with her in the book um, because I've been teaching that for years about um, why, why is it, you know, the big conversation, why is it that women still make 82 cents to the dollar um, compared to a man? And there's a multiple factors in that. And a lot, the main factor is the caregiving issue and it's not addressed. And so, if I can add on to that, sometimes it's not even the caregiving issue, it's the assumption of the caregiving issue. So I work with a lot of, of women who are engineers and whether they choose if they're going to have children or not choose if they're going to have children when they're in interviews of course asked in a very legal way but women of certain ages it will be assumed that they will have to ramp off and then ramp back on and companies lots of times don't want to deal with that not giving even the individual woman the agency of choosing what her lifestyle will be and so there is there is a uh, implicit prejudice that's already set up or if you're an older woman it's assumed that you will be the one taking care of your elderly parents if they're living so some of these biases happen before a, a, a woman opens up her mouth and so that's why you know you do see a lot of initials are used on resumes and not full names if they're if you can tell what the gender is you know, there, there's some certain tricks of trying to learn that. It still doesn't explain the 82 cents on the dollar, um, but, but even the hiring and the promotion and all of that, the discussions that happen behind closed doors are regarding the woman's role outside the home. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time, but I want to make sure, do we have any questions or other comments from anybody else? I, we've, We've touched on a few different things that I'm just curious. I want to make sure that I'm everybody's heard. You know, um, I just kind of comment going into a question. Um, you know, um, having a background in the, the clothing industry, you know, I'm, I never really understood why, but if you look at um, like what a man pays for a suit and what a woman pays for a suit or you know, a pair of shoes, you know, a, a, the structure and the detail and the labor in, in a man's suit um, is completely different than a woman's of the same um, uh, price category. Basically, my opinion has always been for years that, you know, women's clothes are crap and, and men's, men's clothes are well made. And I, you know, that's always kind of been, you know, if a man buys a $300 pair of shoes, it's going to have required a lot more structure than you see in a, a woman's pair of shoes for the same price. So um, I've always wondered, you know, kind of why that is. Um, because if you look at the hems and stuff on women's dresses and just how they're structured, the structure is generally terrible uh, compared to a garment that a man would wear. A man, you know, uh, garments have a much different expectation of what that's gonna look like. So with that being said, um, my question is kind of like, um, you know, I guess that has just like everything else we're talking about has happened over time. And, um, you know, where I guess a, a man expects to get more wear out of a garment than maybe a woman does or something. I don't know what, what that's based upon. But my going into my question would be that because there's a lot of, um, you know, disparities like that um, in different things. So my question would be, you know, if you're talking about specialty design, Lisa, you know, um, a lot of times there is a higher price tag to that because, because there needs to be, because the quantities to recoup, you know, the dollar on that um, design, um, you know, are less. 
So, you know, mass production always makes the price go down. So if you have to produce something in, you know, smaller scale, um, it could tend to drive the price up, although not in every situation. So all of this to say, this is my question. So where do we go with this, you know, and um, if we do need to take another look at everything that is designed from, you know, uh, personal protection items for police and emergency responders to women's clothing to cabinetry, you know, in your home, it's going to take more time and more consideration. Are we willing to pay the price for that? Because there will be a price tag attached to that. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there, something to, to think about. You know, the reason things are done on an average is because it also makes it more efficient and lowers the price, which is why your, you know, your dad builder would say, well, this, you know, th this is the, the standard. Um, so, you know, and, you know, the other piece of that is if we jump over that hurdle and initially it does increase prices of everything, then does it become the norm where the prices then come back down? So, sorry for all that, but my fine. answer would be to that that um, I think yes, the prices would come back down. From my experience with being a universal designer now for over 20 years, people are afraid to have that special design because they think that it's going to cost more. It actually does not. Um, when it's thought out and planned, there's there's maybe um, from the foundation up a $1,500 difference in the foundation, the way that I design it to have an on grade entry coming in from your garage. Um, the overall house is an open plan, which is what people want nowadays. So when I just call it thoughtful design and it's, it goes back to what Byron said about mindfulness. I think as designers, if we started really thinking, about what we're doing and who our users are. And I know in design school today um, at UC that they're very cognizant of who the user is for products, for fashion, for everything. Um, in my brother's industrial design school, it's very much, uh, I think it's becoming a norm to look at that. I think the dialogue needs to continue on a lot of other fronts. I'm appalled at our military um, and our police force that they don't have gender specific um, products and uniforms. But um, I do think that we're headed in that direction and I just think it's because people are becoming more aware um, of these differences. I know that, um, you know, my struggle has been the age difference and what happens from being 20 to being 90 and how the body changes. So if we can get people to really look at this universal design concept with everything, but also being gender specific, then I think that um, it doesn't have to cost more. I really don't think that it has to, but people have to be um, willing to fight for it. You know, women play into the brands. And when you say, Dan, that things aren't made as well, um, women aren't really looking at the quality of what is made. They are looking at that brand, if it's a Michael Kors or Prada or whatever that it is when it comes to the products that they buy. And that's where they spend more for products that I don't think are made any differently than anything else. You know, Lisa, I would just uh, respond to that. I, from a from a one of build, I guess I could accept that. And but if you're talking about manufacturing um, mass-produced products, now that manufacture, I'm just and I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just saying, you know, it's it's another issue. Now you have to you can't produce um, you know bulletproof vest in four sizes. Now you have to produce you know, two styles of bulletproof vests in those four sizes. So it, it does add to the amount of, um, you know, supply that you're going to have to have on hand for people to choose from. So I'm just kind of throwing it up. I'm not meaning to be a pain in the neck, but 
you know, it, it is an issue to look at because now from a retailer or manufacturer's perspective, they have to double their uh, stock that they have to offer to the consumer until they find out what that is going, you know, because now if you have, and I, and I'm, I, you know, if you have the same product made for two different genders um, based upon the, the, the need of those different genders, you automatically double the amount of production that you have to have. But Dan, I will, I will follow up with this. My favorite question that I ask my financial clients and my design clients, when something comes up, as an example, so I have a young couple that comes to me and they want to design a new home and or they want to buy a new home and their mortgage broker has told them that you qualify for this amount. My question is, as is, at what cost? It's not what things look at or appear to cost. It's what is the inherent cost by not doing it. If you buy a home that your mortgage broker says that you can pay for, and that payment each month is keeping you from saving money towards your retirement, from having an emergency fund, sure, you can afford it, but at what cost? You're giving up everything. So for your future. So when I look at somebody that would say to me that, you know, they can't design flak jackets from a manufacturing standpoint because it's going to cost so much, what is the inherent cost of that? Um, what are the lives that are going to be risked because of that? What, what is the inherent cost? It's the same thing when I when we talk about green design and, and I, we, Jennifer and I talked about this the other night too, um, it's the inherent cost. Is it, is it the, the overall cost of what it's going to cost to put solar in, or is it the overall cost of what's going to cost our environment if we don't? So there's always a bigger cost to things than what just the price that something is to obtain. And that would be, that's where I think that this data bias has a huge cost um, overall. When you think about just like the snow plowing analogy that when they looked at the injuries and the healthcare costs that were sustained by the women just because they weren't plowing the sidewalks first, there was a much bigger cost than if they would have just gone out and paid to do both at the same time. It's, it would be my answer to that. It doesn't have to always be a priority. But that's always the bigger question for me, is at what cost? Well, and then I would just respond to that and say, so it has to be consumer driven because the, you know, this is, um, even when a, a manufacturer or a company has a social cause um, and that becomes, you know, um, a, a driver for them in promoting their brand, it's because people are going to buy it. So, you know, I, I guess that whole journey I've kind of taken us down is, you know, it is a major shift. And this is not going to occur, in my opinion, based upon putting pressure on the people who supply the goods. I think it's gonna to have to be the consumer, which is when, when all major trends occur. It's, you know, the consumer putting pressure on the supplier say, we're not going to buy this unless it, you know, provides, you know, the, unless it serves the need that we have. Well, it has to be with be, awareness, right? Yeah. People have right. to be aware. That, and I was, even as a designer, you know, focusing on Universal for 20 plus years, I was not aware of a lot of the biases in this book. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about awareness and having people understand that, they're, that this is going on. If I can, um, I, this is... Uh, when we talk about this concept with women and we go down this, I, I cannot help but think what are, these are very similar questions and conversations when it comes to race or when it comes to ageism. Um, it's, it's, 
it's this idea that we have certain things ingrained in our culture um, that have been deeply rooted in literally promoting the, the success of one particular direction or one particular thing. And I think much of what, you know, and, and uh, ironically, I did this kind of intentionally. My conclusion I made is the same as the introduction because what matters is the pattern. Um, and as we see these things, we have to begin to discuss them and talk about them more openly, regardless of, of, of what this is, there are gaps. And, 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 and Dan, I, 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 I get the questions from an economic perspective, um, you know, and what seems to be most expedient for production and for all these other pieces. Um, and I think that calls into question a bigger, a bigger question of one, what really matters. Um, and that's to the, that the cost of, you know, that question of what was, what is really being expensed here, whether it's economic or lives. But I think there's also a, another component to that of, um, What, what is it, what else is being lost when we simply kind of try to push everybody into one, uh, one design process, one thought process as if everybody is just like me. Um, I think, I think we, we do ourselves, we do our communities, we do our, nation that we do our world of great disservice when we try to see everybody as being the same. Um, and so there's, yeah, what are we saying no to when we say yes to something or the other way around when we say yes to something, what are we saying no to? Um, this is, I'm not sure that I have any real answers for how we move forward from this, except to say we have to continue to be more mindful and promote mindfulness and to promote the thinking and to not just, you know, I, I read all this stuff and, I, and the stuff that I'm reading and I'm seeing all this stuff and I'm like, you know, if I were to go out and throw this out on social media or anywhere else, and we probably would have a whole bunch of people screaming at us that we're a bunch of liberals for doing this. Um, but it's not political. This is about humanity. This is about dignity. It's about empathy. It's about seeing people for who they are and trying to understand them and listening um, and not just assuming that data is good data and that data is objective. Um, we didn't even touch on the tech industry and all the stuff and all the pieces that are coming into how this is affecting prescriptions and medical and oh my goodness, it just goes on and on. Um, we have to be mindful of these things for how they are, are. So I don't know how to wrap this up today, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to, to thoughts. I, you know, this is kind of, I, you know, this is my standard. What are, what are two light bulb moments or insights that, that you've picked up from our conversation today? Things that, things that have, maybe altered the way you're thinking about things, maybe things that have opened your eyes to something different. And what is an action step that you are, can take away from today? What is something that you can do this week in conversations, in mentioning, or I, I don't know what that would look like, but for you, um, you know, and I would love to hear what those are. If you get a chance, shoot me an email. Um, tell me what your light bulb moments or insights were for today. What is your action step? What is it that you want to do differently this week? Um, that based on our conversation today is going to have an impact, um, for you, for your community, for your workplace. Any other thoughts or questions? I, I have one more slide just to introduce the next conversation in August, but I want to make sure I'm, any comments or questions here at the end? Um, 
Byron, I would just say one thing, which kind of along the lines of, you know, um, I certainly relate to a lot of things that Lisa is saying with age. Um, and, um, you know, thing, certain things do become more difficult. Um, I know I'm frustrated every morning in the bathroom because nothing is designed um, well to be used in the bathroom. I think if disease designers ever use this stuff, you know, when your hands are wet and you're trying to open the toothpaste and, you know, get the cap off the shave cream, which, by the way, is impossible when your hands are wet, um, you know, and things like that. So, you know, I think it is um, an interesting category. But, you know, I think the other thing that um, is really critical right now is, you know, having a little bit of hearing impairment myself um, with the plexiglass screens and the masks. Um, my life is a nightmare. Um, you know, I was at the doctor's office yesterday and they had to simply repeat everything they said to me um, because I didn't realize how much I um, depend upon people's clarity when they speak and how much I watch their mouth when they talk and taking that away and then putting it behind the plexiglass screen. You know, I know for myself, it is more challenging. Um, and every trip to the grocery store, the doctor's office or whatever, everything, has become a huge challenge. And I think that, um, you know, you would think in a doctor's office that they would be understanding of that, you know, and I finally said, I cannot understand or hear you, you know, um, you know, with the screen and the masks. And so we've taken everything we've talked about and, and made it even more difficult. Um, and so maybe it's a time for understanding that everybody is um, suffering a little bit of impairment with communication right now. And maybe it's a little window into, you know, just how difficult um, it can be for some people that are dealing with very specific challenges. Yeah. yeah thank you. It, it, and um, one of the things that, that Jen and I often talk about too is the idea of not ascribing intent. Um, and, and sometimes it's very easy when, when we feel like we've been slighted or that somehow people aren't mindful of our needs or our concerns, we, we assume and ascribe an intent that is negative. Um, I think for a lot of the things that we have going on right now uh, in our country and wherever else, but I, I think just that idea of just taking a, taking a step back and taking a breath and trying to... to understand and seek to seek to hear and to listen um and i mean from it and i'm and i'm saying more from it this is a you know more of a of a, of a mindset issue not just of a specific event where um in dan's case yes we want to speak louder and more clearly and be mindful of that um but just that idea that not to ascribing it not to ascribe intent but to really seek to understand as much as we can uh, I think we would be a much better community and a better nation if we could do that together. Um, anyway, yeah, this, this is a, uh, when we start talking values and these kind of things, this is where I, I, it, it, it hits home because I, I think we can make a difference in our businesses, how we are mindful about the people that we interact with, how we do this in a way that it impacts great communities are built on good business. When you see business disappear, you see community suffer. And so I want to help businesses grow and thrive in their culture, in their how they are working and empowering their people. Um, in August, we're going to talk about business networking. So this is the conversation. It's much more of a practical piece. It's the idea that connecting to the world around us is based on generosity, helping friends connect with other friends. Um, but there is a distinction between genuine relationship building and kind of what has been a crude, desperate, glad handling of, you know, usually associated with networking and showing up and, hey, 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 here's my card and moving on. Um, so in August, we're going to discuss how to convert a system of reaching out to people into some practical proven steps um, and want to be able to empower you guys to, um, sorry, and I just said you guys, that's to empower you uh, in being the best networker that you can be for the success of your business. And uh, these are actually uh, themes based uh, from the book and Never Eat Alone, 
as well as uh, uh, The Coaching Habit is another book that we'll be diving into as well. We've gone over a little bit of time, but I am really grateful that you've all stuck with us and had this conversation with us. Uh, thank you for your willingness to participate today. Lisa, I am very grateful to you. Thank you for your uh, willingness to join the conversation today. Uh, Dan, thank you. Thank you for the chamber uh, for your help as well. And Jen, thank you for chiming in. Love to hear, as always, uh, your thoughts and ideas on this. Have a great day and a great week and look forward to seeing you in August, if not before. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.